Public Affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Dreamers, are they really running out of time and out of options? And the delicate artwork of a master wood turner, unique pieces on display in the cities. American immigration is one of the defining issues of our time, but no one seems willing to tackle comprehensive legislation. The president says he's trying to push for solutions by building a border wall, adding extra national security, and forcing Congress to act on immigration reform. Part of that push came last fall when the president gave a March 5th deadline to deal with the issue of children of illegal immigrants living in this country under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, DACA. Well, that deadline came and went, and joining us are two people on the forefront of the immigration debate. Maria Bribriasco is the Deputy State Director of LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, and Jasmine Newton-Butt is the President of LULAC's Davenport Chapter. Ladies, thank you both for joining us. I thank appreciate you. it. Let's start with the here and now. The deadline came and went last week. Where are we right now? We're still in limbo land. We don't know what's coming down. The, the effect of the deadline coming and going and having two court injunctions have placed us in limbo. Really, I, I am not a psychic. We don't have a crystal ball to figure out what's going to happen. And having said that, that just means that the tension and the stress for the young dreamers is increasing. And tell me why that is. I mean, when we have a lawsuit right now, which is really putting the hold on a lot of Correct. things, there's so much uncertainty. Correct. Um, there's actually several lawsuits. Um, the two major lawsuits that stand out are the, is the one from California um, in the, in, that falls in the second district and then, or the second circuit court, and then the one from New York. And those two stand out aside from the other, because there's several, because both have had issues, um, injunctions issued to basically stop the administration from essentially not taking any more renewal applications for DACA. So both of those are currently in limbo, as uh, Maria said, because they, I mean, it's a, it's a long process, the court battle is. It is. And certainly, and, and the administration tried to take a direct to the Supreme Court and pretty much skip the appellate court. Mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court uh, er, later in February said, no, we're not gonna do that. There's so a process, you will follow that process. Absolutely. So meanwhile, that, uh, it creates a lot of uncertainty, which causes a lot of stress to the dreamers, essentially. Um, the dreamers, well, first of all, when we're referring to dreamers, we're referring to children who were brought here by their parents who are undocumented. Um, the dreamers compromise an estimated 1.8 million. Um, the DACA program served essentially 800,000. Right. That's just the ones that came forth um, in the proverbial out of the shadows. And registered, and so to speak. Absolutely, and applied for the program, but it's estimated that there's another million out there that would qualify based on those terms. To those people in particular who, who like you said, uh, signed up and now are on record, I mean, is it almost like, oh, we should not have done that? It, it certainly has created a lot of mistrust in the government. Um, they came out of the shadows, so to speak. Mm -hmm. They registered. They followed every protocol that was asked of them. Uh, they took the biometrics test, they, and they qualify. I mean, one thing that people need to understand is these people have no criminal background. They cannot have a felony. They cannot have more than three misdemeanors or certainly a serious misdemeanor. And then they have to also have a high school diploma or GED equivalency. And I mean, show that they are contributing. They pay taxes and, and obviously help bring our economy up. So they've done everything. And then it's taken away from them well, in an instant. Maria, I mean, when we talk about dreamers locally, I mean, are we talking about hundreds of people or are we talking about thousands? I would say locally it'd be in the hundreds because Illinois, uh, Iowa has very few mm -hmm. and I think the, the majority come from California and Texas and then it's Illinois. So we don't have that many. I, I think the, what we need to think about when we talk about DACA and the Dreamers, I think we've covered the statistics over and over and I believe that the general public, the majority of the public wants to take care of the Dreamers. So what's going on? Why isn't Congress doing it? 
<laughs> and let me go there because that is the big question. I mean, we, we faced a government shutdown over this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy Pelosi stood up in, in the House and, mm -hmm. and had a mini filibuster, as it were, right. over this issue. And this issue still really has not been resolved in any way, shape, or form. It's unfortunate, and I really believe that it's a, it, 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 the politicians are using it as a distraction. We have so many, so many issues in front of us that this is a simple, simple thing to take care of. You give legal status to these dreamers, and then we can move on. I don't expect Congress to tackle comprehensive immigration reform. That would take a lot. But let's take care of the dreamers. Let's give them legal status, not necessarily a path to citizenship. At this point, I just want to protect them from being deported. And then we need to talk about the bigger, the root cause of what's going mm -hmm. on here. I really believe there's an ugly aspect of racism going on. LULAC is a national civil rights organization. And what, what I see from with this immigration issues, we're seeing it on the state level. Like here in Iowa, we have SF 481, which is, it's, it's unbelievable that, that such a bill is be, even being considered because what it's doing it's, it's, it's requiring, if it passes, it would require local law enforcement officials to enforce federal immigration laws. Mm -hmm. And it prohibits cities from, de from declaring or proclaiming themselves welcoming cities or sanctuary cities. I find that baffling. Nobody wanted that bill, and yet it's, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, debated and heard. Well, I mean, when you're talking about the future of a group of people that's just being debated or not even debated in the mm -hmm. halls of the legislature and in Congress, that almost would seem very frustrating to me, is that um, nothing is getting accomplished and perhaps the debate in your eyes isn't even all that serious. Well, it's not that the debate's not serious. I feel that the best way to put it is they're using the dreamers as a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to, rather than focusing on the bipartisan bill, the DREAM Act, they're trying to put it all together with a full immigration reform. Um, like during the State of the Union speech, President Trump announced his idea, which would include the, the, four, the four pillars of this reform. And with it comes $25 billion for a wall. With it comes reducing the amount of immigration that's coming in by getting rid of the lottery system, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Also, uh, getting rid of what they call chain migration. Whereas right now, a person who is lawfully here can petition to have like a parent, for example, also uh, become, get lawful status in the United States. They want to get rid of that. So where a person could only petition a, a child, their own child, or a spouse. So there's too much being thrown into the limbo, and, they're, and I think they have lost focus of the, the first and foremost issue is this, the DREAM Act that would help these dreamers, so to speak. Well, the administration allowed renewals last month, which re -ticked, restarted the two-year deadline um, as far as this concerned, and many didn't do it. Um, mm -hmm. Out of 150,000 eligible, only 20,000 uh, really signed in to re-up. Um, is that almost like uh, uh, burn me once, you're not going to burn me a second time? Well, I, I think what, what I've been reading and hearing is that a lot of the, uh, the dreamers don't want to pay the $495 and go exactly. through the process mm -hmm. when they're going to be, it's going to be yanked from them. They don't know when. And so it's th they're, I think they're wise to play wait and see. But on the other hand, I don't know. I think I'd be filing because I'd have some protection until something definitely happens. What's going on with the injunctions, this matter has been put in the back burners for the, uh, for the Senate. I actually called Senator Ernst's office to find out what's going on. Because I did research, I, I Googled and tried to figure out what's going on, nothing is going on. And, and Andrew from Senator Ernst's office said, nope, nothing was going on, the Senate wasn't doing anything, he didn't think the House was doing anything either. Uh, that Speaker Ryan didn't have the necessary votes to even put immigration, an immigration bill on the floor. So what that happens, when that happens, Jim, you know what, this delay, it is putting a damper on the enthusiasm of the people that were fighting so hard for the dreamers. There's so many other things coming up that they're being forgotten. And I think that that's our job mm -hmm. to try to keep this issue on the forefront because it is very real, they're in jeopardy. They're in jeopardy of being deported. I wanna go back to the renewals though, just briefly, is that uh, under the new plan is that the Department of Homeland Security is accepting them, but now 
is processing them first come first serve as opposed to the ones that are closest to hitting their own personal deadline. They were trying to get those done ahead of time. So are you recommending to people to do it, to get renewed, to be ready? Well, whenever that comes or anything that's a question of immigration law, I recommend and I always tell any dreamers that contact, you know, the organization of LULAC, contact me directly, that they need to meet with an immigration attorney, um, one who specializes in that area of the law and that can better, based on their, you know, their whole case, give them an opinion on what they should do. But as you know, there's always the issue of costs. Absolutely. And, and it's not an easy thing for every family to muster. No, and unfortunately, cost is, it's, is a big issue for a lot of families when it comes to any legal issue. Um, I think going back to why a lot of people aren't applying, uh, we, we have a lot of dreamers that contact us uh, because of our organization. We mm -hmm. are a civil rights organization, and they do know that we are adamantly fighting for their rights. Um, it's, uh, so to speak, we're trying to be the voice that they don't have right now. So they contact us, and a lot of people, a dreamer specifically, are fearful. They don't trust the administration. They don't trust the government at this point. I mean, they're, they're scared. I mean, a lot of these dreamers are afraid of what's gonna happen if I get deported. Some have children of their own now, the children that are US born children and they're concerned, you know, are, uh, are sometimes con is contacted and they wanna know, well, what should we do? What happens to my child? Does my child get separated from me for any period of time? Do they get to go with me? So, I mean, it's unfortunately, I agree with Maria that the issue has been placed on the back burner. Part of the reason because of what's going on in the court system, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that deadline that seemed to be so pressing initially when Trump said March 5th has now been placed on hold because of the injunctions that were issued out of two courts. And it's speculated that a few more courts will issue similar injunctions because there are several other lawsuits out of other states that are similar in nature. Plus also, I mean, it is an election year. And when mm -hmm. it comes to immigration issues, it is used as a political hot potato by both sides to their advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's got to be somewhat upsetting because you're caught in the middle. It's not, it's not a political thing to you. No, no, it's, a, I mean, there's lives at stakes. You know, people have to know what's going to happen to them. Uh, it, unfortunately, when, when it becomes politicized, P people don't know which way to go. Mm -hmm. So when when uh, when they call and ask what should we do, like Jasmine says, you know, you, every every circumstance is unique, but what they need to do is what's best for them. All right. And what we need to do is we need to keep fighting for them. They're not citizens, so as citizens, we have to be their voice. We're the ones that can vote, and that's why, as a civil rights organization, we make sure that we get people civically engaged. We're out there vo registering people to vote. We're getting them informed about the issues, and anything that smells of racial profiling, we're uh, we're against. For instance, did you know that um, the state of Texas? I keep coming back to this. Uh, this bill that Iowa has, the SF-481, it's a horrible bill. They, they passed a similar one in Texas, which of course was challenged, and portions of it ha have been held unconstitutional. This Senate bill in Iowa will also be unconstitutional because it actually encourages racial profiling. As, um, as a Mexican-American, uh, Latinos, anybody that might look not you know blue-eyed and, and fair-skinned, a police officer will ask you, are you a U.S. citizen? Mm -hmm. And I think we have a right to not answer. And so I wonder how many problems that will you know, cause when, when law enforcement officers start acting like Border Patrol. Well, Jasmine, let me take you one more step. As next week, once again, Congress mm -hmm. is going to be arguing the budget. There could be another government shutdown. Do you think that this issue will become focused front and center once again like it did last time? Unfortunately, and, and again, I, I'm asked to speculate because it's hard to tell what Congress is going to do, but I don't think that it's going to be forefront as it was before. I think that because of everything that's happening within the court system on the issue, it's kind of just been placed on hold. So the best right now to do is what? I mean, how are you going to try to keep it in the limelight? And what are you telling people that are so overly concerned, not only about themselves, but friends and family as well? Well, I agree with Maria. What we have to do is, is continue to educate people regarding the issues. I think that when it comes to immigration issue, the issues of immigration, a lot of people don't know any the facts behind immigration. Um, it's just if 
you look at a news article that's posted on social media and then you go through the comments and you see comments that where people are saying, oh, well, they should have became citizens. It clearly shows they don't understand the issue because these dreamers would love to be citizens. They would line up tomorrow if we, if we told them, here's where you go to become a U.S. citizen. But that's not the case. And that's one, one, one of the main reasons we say our system is broken, is that often there is not a pathway to lawful status or a pathway to citizenship. You get the last word. Well, um, I was going to talk about how the, the appeal process. Mm -hmm. we, the appeals right now in the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, right. we believe that the appeal uh, the judges, are they lean more progressive. So we think we'll probably win. So then exactly. will the U.S. Supreme Court accept that case or is it too much of a hot potato and they'll say mm -hmm. no, let Congress come up with a legislative fix. But if they take it, I, I fear for the dreamers. Because I think it will be a 5-4 decision and it won't be in the favor of the dreamers. We will find out, though. Yes. Jasmine Newton, but thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for Maria having us. Always nice to see you as well. Thank Both you. representatives of uh, LULAC mm -hmm. throughout uh, Iowa and the Quad Cities. Still ahead, an artist immersed in wood. The amazing work of artist Steve Sinner. But first, we're marching into the new month with great activities both indoor and out. And Laura Adams takes a look at it all as she goes out and about. This is Out and About for March 12th through 18th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. The St. Patrick Society present their Grand Parade March 17th. The nation's only bi-state St. Patrick's Day Parade starts at 11.30 a.m. at the corner of 4th Avenue and 23rd Street in Rock Island. The Shamrock Bash at the Hogberg Center is coming March 17th. Delicious food, entertainment, silent auction, and cash bar. The annual KSI St. Patrick's Day Race is happening March 17th in downtown Davenport starting at 8.30 a.m. While the Quad City Botanical Center holds their second annual Quad Cities Community Seed Swap. That's coming March 14th. The Figgy Art Museum presents Steve Sinner, Master Woodturner, highlighting examples of Sinner's solo work. And the Bearskin Gallery is hosting a photographic exhibit titled The Magical Glow of Fireflies through April 28th. Venus in Fur, the Tony Award-winning dark comedy of desire and gamesmanship, takes the stage at the QC Theatre Workshop. 309 Improv is a night of downright dirty and devious uncensored improv at the establishment rated R. Plus, Michael W. Smith's Million Lights World Tour is coming to the Adler Theater March 16th. The Bucktown Review present their epic annual St. Patty's Day show at the Davenport Junior Theater March 16th. Neil Simon's play Proposals takes place at Playcrafters Barn Theater in Moline through the 18th. And Circa 21 is holding local auditions for Mamma Mia and Madagascar the Musical Adventure. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Singer-songwriter Beth Ann Gavin also describes herself as a mother, actress, student, vegan, and coffee and chocolate enthusiast. A true renaissance woman, you could say. She's also a frequent performer at the River Music Experience in downtown Davenport. We caught up with her on the community stage performing an original work. Sometimes I fall into the past Think too much on things that did not last As I grow older, now I know I'll still be with you wherever you go Let it go with the rest and I wish you the best Many times, many thoughts Many times, I got caught as I grow older, now I know I'll still be with you wherever you go. Let it go with the rest, and I wish you the best. Still love you all the time. 
The Figgy Art Museum is known for its works from artists nationwide, if not around the world. Curators are very particular about the artwork shown in its major galleries, and that's why it's extraordinary that a local artist is being featured at the Figgy, but then again, he's an extraordinary artist. Joining us now is Master Woodturner Steve Sinner from Bettendorf, proud of the Quad Cities, and that's what makes this so unique. Like we said, the Figgy, we believe that you might be the very first local artist to have such a prominent exhibit at the Figgy. What does that mean? I certainly hope I'm not the last. I'm the first. <laughs> That's very well yeah. said. Uh, you know, artists are, are like a lot of other people. Uh, you know, you're an expert if uh, an expert is a person that's 60 miles from home with a briefcase or something <laughs> like that. It's kind of the same thing with artists. You're not really generally appreciated in your own community uh, as you are elsewhere. However, it's been a little bit different in the Quad Cities, fortunately. Now, your area of expertise is very unique as well. A master woodturner, you're a master of the lathe, but there's so much more to it than that. There is. I actually, uh, when we got into this art business, I started out to be a woodturner. That was my intent. And, uh, you know, I thought I'd become a known woodturner. I would try to. And I thought my chances of doing that and succeeding were slim and none. But I thought, what the heck, even if I uh, never uh, do finally uh, realize that desire, I would die happily trying to uh, <laughs> succeed. And then I found myself uh, in venues that were featuring other artists uh, like uh, Dale Chihuly and Lino Tagliapietra, that we're worldwide known artists and we're in the same venue. Uh, people started calling me an artist and I thought, that isn't right, and then, <laughs> I thought, well, if they are here and I am here, maybe I better accept the term. Well, I always think, you know, when, when it comes to uh, uh, woodwork such as that, I think of table legs and I think of chair legs and I think of chalices and of vases and I think of just amazingly beautiful work. But it's more than that? It's much more than that. Yeah. Uh, of course it is. Uh, this is an art form, uh, wood turning and the associated things. It, it, it isn't really limited to wood turning itself. There are other things that get involved, but a lot of the basic processes involve the lathe, so we call it wood turning. Uh, it's only grown up and been recognized as an art form in the last about 40, 45 years. And it's so new that we don't actually have a lot of terms to describe the different things that we do as uh, exist in so many other forms of art. So it's now accepted in many, many uh, major museums and most major art museums. And of course, the Figgy has embraced it in a, in a great way. They have a, a considerable collection of wood art uh, and it's growing. Yeah. I think what people don't also understand, and I certainly didn't know, is how intricate it is. And, and, and you're showing us one particular piece that you have here, which is amazing, because that does not look like something that could be handmade. Well, I brought this one in because there was a question about how thin or how thick uh, the vessels are. And uh, this one is, is a goblet that's made out of maple and it's about a half a millimeter thick, about the thickness of my thumbnail. And it's been pierced so that you can uh, have a pattern, see a pattern in it. It's absolutely amazing. 
And so how is, is this made in the typical way that you would make? I mean, is there the lathe, does it start with a block of wood or how sure do you? Sure it does, yeah. There's Seriously. A, a, block, a block of wood is sticking out of the lathe and you take uh, uh, gouges. We use, by the way, chisels is a term that's probably technically correct, but wood turners don't use the term chisel. They talk about gouges or scrapers, okay. basically. <laughs> and, and gouges cut, scrapers scrape. So you would use those tools and, and to make this one, uh, it would be sticking out of the headstock and spinning very sure. rapidly. And you would first do the inside. And so you have the inside of the bowl. And then I set a light up here so that uh, I have a, a, a bright red light coming in here and start to turn down, establish this thickness up here and measure it. And once I see how much red light comes through that particular point, I continue on down, keeping the light the same all the way down, which controls the thickness as you go. So you see, once you find out how you do it, it's not really all that. Oh, I don't know about that. But I mean, for the audience that may not even recognize this, this is the thickness, the stem is the thickness of a toothpick. Right. And you can get even smaller, because yeah. Steve showed me this, which, I mean, this plastic is small enough but the intricacy of the item is just in this very little tip. You, can, you have amazing eyes. Yeah. I'm afraid of taking it out. I'm, you know what? I will show it on camera, but I'm not going to take it out because <laughs> okay. I have a feeling if I sneeze, it goes away. If we drop it on the floor, it'll be very <laughs> difficult to find it. So tell me about uh, the importance of, of you being uh, presented at the Figgy. Well, as, as we talked about before, it's, it's uh, a first, we think, uh, as far as we know. And uh, I, I was floored when uh, Tim asked me if I'd like to have a, an exhibition there. I, I had never even considered that that might be a possibility. So it's, it's uh, considerable, yeah. It's, and we had a, at the, the opening reception, we had a great turnout, mm -hmm. uh, had a good time there. It's very well received. A lot of people. And it, it's amazing to see what has been on display and what will be on display. Master Woodturner, Steve Sinner. The Figgy highlights 30 pieces of his solo work and collaborations now through June 24th at the Figgy in downtown Davenport. Please go see it. It is sponsored by the John Deere Foundation, Schaefer Interiors, Dr. Randy and Linda Lewis, and Merrill Lynch, the Sing Group. It is presented by WQPT. Thank you, Steve, so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. Thank you. WQPT is doing its part to support the military men and women in the cities who are serving our nation. We call it embracing the military and get ready to go ghost hunting next week on Arsenal Island. The next Quarters One Ghost Hunters Dinner Tour is next Friday, starting at the Arsenal Island Clubhouse. It starts at 6, ends at 10. Includes a rib, a prime rib dinner, I should say, and chicken buffet at the uh, Arsenal Clubhouse before the tour of Quarters One with the Elite Paranormal Society. So you can make your reservations right now with the MWR office and, and be scared out of your wits on the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public Affairs Programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.